Jenny Webb had a magnetic personality attracting everyone around. Tell me a little bit about Jenny growing up. I always thought of her as the sparkle of the family. She loved life and she had a good attitude. Nothing ever got her down. She was just the most happiest, loving person you'd ever want to meet. The 32-year-old from Buena Vista, Michigan had even more to be happy about these days. She was eight and a half months pregnant with her first child, a boy. Jenny's mom, Dawn, was in shock when she first heard her daughter was expecting. For that matter, so was Jenny. She was five months pregnant before she found out she was pregnant. She was five months pregnant? Five months pregnant, yes. And I'm like, you're pregnant? He said, you know, you're not even really dating anybody. Even still, there was no question as to who the father was. What did she tell you about him? Well, she and he had been um, friends for probably 10 years. I had never met him. She would say the name, that's all she told me, that he was the father. There was a reason she wasn't with the father. He was married. She was under the impression that he was separated, not even living with his wife at the time. And that's when they entered into a more intimate relationship. Yes. And just to be clear, because she was carrying his baby, mm -hmm. was she in love with him? No, absolutely not. And did she have any fantasies of marrying him or bringing up the baby together? Absolutely not. So Jenny was preparing to be a single mother to a son she'd name Braxton. So she was pretty much set in her life, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and things were going well for her. Yes. Yes, she had a good job and she had bought a house. And starting a family of her own. Yes. So things were definitely very good. Mm -hmm. But how true was that really? When a decision is made to end it all. It's a beautiful evening in late August. After work, Jenny goes to her best friend Andrea's house to help her with newborn twin girls. Jenny can't stay too late. She has plans that night to meet up with her baby's father. I said, you know, what are you guys meeting up about? And she said, well, we need to discuss this whole child support thing. And did she also want to put his name on the birth certificate? Yes. And how did he feel about it? Um, I think that was one of the things that he was kind of on the fence about. So they were discussing that as well. So when she left that night, walked out the door, what's the last thing you two said to each other? Um, I thanked her for helping me with the girls. And she said, same time tomorrow. And I said, if you're willing. And she goes, yep. And she stepped off the porch and she goes, see ya. And she drove off. A couple of hours later, a gruesome discovery on a secluded road. A Pontiac Aztec parked near a ditch, and a woman with an extension cord around her neck is found hanging from the car's luggage rack. The first on the scene, Buena Vista Township police officer Kenneth Blue, followed by officer Tim Patterson. When Patterson rolls up, the first thing Blue does is get out of his car and say, how do you want to do this? Both approach the vehicle and see the victim. It's Jenny Webb. Neither seem to know her. Officer Blue pulls the victim's purse out of her car and finds a small folded piece of paper. Officers Blue and Patterson read it together. It's a suicide note. There were a lot of details in the suicide note that she had lied about the true identity of the baby's father. She finally revealed that his name was Chris. She goes on to say she met him at a bar one night and lied. She's ruined her life and feels like a failure because she can't afford to support herself and her baby. The suicide note ends with, it's the only way. I love you and I'm sorry, Jenny. After reading the note, Officer Blue pulls out the victim's wallet. He looks at her ID and then proclaims, gee, I know this girl. Turns out he says it's a girl he knows from one of the local bars. Minutes later, Detective Sergeant Sean Waterman arrives on the scene. When I first get there, um, Officer Patterson comes up to me and says, we got this girl over here and uh, she looks like she hung herself. The Officer Patterson tells me, that uh, he had come back here looking for Officer Blue because he wasn't answering his radio checks. And I figured he was probably out here somewhere. As cops investigate the scene, Officer Ken Blue takes evidence photos. But it all appears to be 
pretty open and shut. You know, you sit here and you're looking at the scene and it looks like legitimate suicide scene. Not many women normally hang themselves, but I have seen it. And so it didn't look anything out of the order at that time. So the car is towed away and Jenny Webb's body is taken to the morgue. Detective Waterman then makes his way to Jenny's family's home to deliver the heartbreaking news. That horrible night, how did you find out? The phone rang in the middle of the night and it was um, Sean Waterman said, I'm on your porch, please come open your door. And I opened the door and he said, there's been a suicide. And I said, a suicide? And he said, yes, Jennifer Webb. And, and I said, which is kind of dumb, but I said, is she dead? And he said, yes. And I said, she may be dead but she did not commit suicide. What about the suicide note? When I saw the suicide note, um, it was typed, it was single spaced, it was in size 10 font, and it was just worded so unlike my daughter. If Jenny would have written a suicide note, it would have been in her own handwriting, in a glitter pen, in purple or green or pink, and each person would have got their own copy. It would have never, ever, it never would have looked the way it did. And the content of that letter? I don't even remember most of it because I only, I probably only read about a quarter of it and I knew that it, it just wasn't legitimate, so I didn't bother reading the rest of it. Jenny Webb, eight and a half months pregnant, is dead. An apparent suicide that heartbreakingly also claims the life of her unborn son, Braxton. Mom dies, baby dies. That's just the way it is. So and tragic. So it's very tragic. It's just incredibly tragic. But Jenny's friends and family emphatically say Jenny did not take her own life. You knew in your heart mm -hmm. that your daughter was not suicidal. That's right. That's right. She was excited to have this baby. She wanted to be a mother. She was not suicidal by any means. Then the question that would cause a tectonic shift in the case. Who's the father of Jenny's baby? Mr. Webb just looked at me and said, your officer, Ken Blue. Now, I've been in public safety a long time. I was a paramedic before that. Okay, I did a tour in Southeast Asia. So I, not much rattles you, but that rattled me. I just couldn't believe it. I felt sick to my stomach. Sick to his stomach because Waterman knew Officer Ken Blue was the one who found Jenny hanging from the luggage rack of her own car. Blue was the one who found the suicide note in her purse. And now Blue, a married man with a family of his own, was the father of her baby. And I knew right then and there he did it. And I just knew this whole thing was staged. Buena Vista Township PD can't investigate one of their own, so Michigan State Police are called in. Detective Sergeant Alan Ogg will be the lead investigator. You got on the scene. Was everything still there? Nothing was there. The body had been removed, the vehicle had been towed, everything was gone. And were you thinking, oh no? Um, I knew that that made it a little more difficult. The scene is secured until forensic scientists Gary Ginther and Valerie Bowman arrive the next morning. Once there, they make a discovery in the ditch below where Jenny's car was parked. A pair of flip-flops, but not much else. There wasn't really a whole lot there. And for whatever reason, I was just standing along the asphalt, uh, just saying there has to be evidence here someplace. There, there's evidence that we're not seeing or finding. And, and lo and behold. Lo and behold indeed. 195 feet from where Jenny's body was found, Ginther finds a cigarette butt lying on the ground. And that's not all. I just turned around and looked down and observed the uh, blood spot. Uh, and then eventually not too far away from that blood spot was a little necklace uh, piece. A cigarette butt a necklace charm, and blood. Possibly three bombshell pieces of evidence. 
everything collected is sent to the lab for testing, including Jenny's and Blue's cars. The Pontiac Aztec was towed to the laboratory, and we also processed Officer Ken Blue's patrol vehicle. So what was Officer Blue up to that night? Turns out Blue had been strangely silent, not answering any radio checks for the hour and a half leading up to Jenny's body being found. He goes dark on his police radio from about 9.05 or so to 10.30 when Officer Patterson has finally had it with, where, where's Blue? He's not, he's not responding, so he goes out looking for him. It was then when Patterson headed to one specific dead-end road in an isolated part of town. How did Officer Patterson know to go to that location? That was where Blue would go uh, if he was going to sleep on the job. He sees Ken's car there, sees the victim's car, and Ken says, yeah, I was just getting ready to call you. I found this girl. According to Patterson, Blue looked disheveled and out of sorts. When he got there, um, Blue was all sweaty and out of breath. And the more cops dig, the more pieces of evidence point to Blue. In Jenny's phone, in Jenny's contact list, she referred to Officer Blue as Ken Cop Boo. She did. Ken Cop Boo. And of course, when Sergeant Waterman found that number in her phone, he not only knew, well, Ken Cop Boo, what's the coincidence there, but the phone number that was attached to it, he knew Ken Blue's cell phone number. He recognized it right away. He recognized that these three calls had been made that evening. Three calls between Jenny and Officer Blue on the night she was found dead. Detectives also learn Jenny and Officer Blue had planned to meet that evening around 9 o'clock to discuss child support and putting his name on the baby's birth certificate. So what did Officer Blue have to say about it all? Michigan State Police believe Jenny Webb, eight and a half months pregnant, was murdered and staged to look like a suicide. Their suspect? The father of Jenny's baby. Buena Vista Township Police Officer Ken Blue, first on the scene that night, and as it turns out, back again. I go out to the crime scene. State police are there, crime lab's there, and lo and behold, who comes pulling up in his civilian clothes? Ken Blue. To the crime scene? To the crime scene. What is he doing? <laughs> Trying to gather information of what's going on, and the, he was ordered back to the station to stay there. Back at the Buena Vista Police Station, Sergeant Og is shown evidence photos from the night before. Photos taken by none other than Officer Blue. So when you first got a chance to see the evidence photos, you already knew that the suspect is the one who had taken them. Yes. That must have been pretty creepy. Very unusual. Never have had a case like that in my career. I'm curious, when Officer Blue cleared that scene that night. He probably thought he was done and in the clear. Yeah, he probably was. He was asked by his chief to remain at the police department to be available for my interview. I would say at this point, the wanting to give the appearance of being fully cooperative, nothing to hide, he did that and sat through that interview. That interview, about nine hours after Jenny's body was found, would be conducted by Sergeant Og and Lieutenant Jason Teddy. It starts like three cops just hanging out. <laughs> Is that going to do it all day? <laughs> Man, you are one important dude. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good idea. I'm just playing now. Yeah. Just mess around. I'll shut mine up too so we can all behave. But things quickly turn serious. Just tell me what happened tonight. What's, what's going on here? Blue says he was patrolling the area when he saw a stopped vehicle. I drive in behind the car focus the spotlight and about that time Tim's pulling up. He says he and officer Tim Patterson approached the vehicle at the same time. I started to walk kind of towards the driver's side corner and as I got closer I saw the door open, the uh, back door, back driver's door was open. Took a few more steps and I saw her laying on the ground. I saw the cord running to the top of the car. Oh my gosh. I yelled at Tim real quick. I said, hey, we got a body. Blue says he found the suicide note in her purse, then went looking for the victim's identification. Found the wallet, opened the wallet up, went through the wallet, found the ID, and at that point I went, oh, I know this girl. 
Do you guys check for vitals? Hmm. Why not? I don't know. I you know I just I guess probably not to disturb. Well, I mean there was no movement. You know, and when I, you know when I looked, that there was I mean from a distance there didn't appear to be any chest rise. You know, I mean lips were kind of bluish. I mean it it wasn't giving me the impression that it was you know that she was alive. Blue goes on to say he's actually known Jenny for 10 years. They were friends, recently seeing each other once or twice a month. How did you not recognize her when you first walked up? Given the position that she was in, and it was, I mean, that's the hard part. I don't mean to sound like an ass, I'm just thinking, how would you not recognize her? Just kind of going to, going to Kyle at that point, it's just, okay, what do I gotta do? But you, you, you got a good enough look at her to see that her chest wasn't rising and falling, that her lips were blue. Correct. I said, I mean, that, that's, not a, that's not a position that I ever see her in. I mean, when I see her, she's got her hair done. So, you know, here, here, a guy like me and Al is struggling with this right now because we're looking at one of our own sitting here and going, how do you, how do you go, how do you talk to a guy about this? And, I, and I'm sure you saw it coming, but. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, when, once I realized I knew her, I okay. Bring it on. I mean, it's gonna happen, so. Okay. But there's a there's a lot of things that have come up already that I mean the flags, brother. The flags. I know. During the interview, Og notices some scratches on Blue. He had injuries on his body that uh, were very suspicious. In particular, he had a serious injury to his one eye. His claim was that the night before, before he came to work, he had been wrestling with his dog on the floor or whatever, and the dog injured his eye. It's right in the inside yeah. corner, right there, Chicago, the Tonya. One of his co-workers had eaten dinner with him during their shift that night and sat across the table from him, and that co-worker said there was no injuries, nothing wrong with his eye. Blue also had a Band-Aid on his right index finger and scratches on his head and his forearm. You know what that looks like? If I were to grab you with my fingernails, what would I leave? Was there any possibility that her fingernails are gonna have any DNA underneath them? That's no, I don't know. I mean, well, I don't know. I don't, I wasn't there. Multiple times during the interview, Blue denies ever having sex with Jenny. Jennifer Faye, who was the father of that child? I have no idea. Is there a chance that you're the father of that child, Ken? None. Hmm? None. Never slept with her. You've never had a sexual relationship with her? No. Is there any reason that she would have told people that you were the father of that child? Not that I know. She has. Come again. She has told people that you're the father of that child? Her family was well aware of who the father of that child was. Didn't know you personally, but was well aware of what your name was, where you worked, what you did, and everything. Huh. Wow. No possibility of that? None. Eventually, detectives ask for a swab of Blue's DNA, but he first needs to sign a release. When I requested of him to sign a consent form, he hesitated before signing it. Why is it that I'm feeling more and more like a suspect every time? I every minute I this right here. And then, just before he put pen to paper, said, I can't tell you one thing, guys. I did, in fact, sleep with her. 32-year-old Jenny Webb and her unborn son Braxton are dead. Investigators believe the father of that child, one of their own, a cop, the Una Vista Township police officer Ken Blue, murdered them and staged it to look like a suicide. Now it looks like my brother, and all I can tell you is I didn't. But what Blue says happened, that he found Jenny with an extension cord around her neck, hanging off the side of her own car, doesn't fit the evidence. Could someone truly have committed suicide in the way she was positioned? No. Um, practically speaking, no. It was quite inconsistent with a suicide attempt. Former Saginaw medical examiner, Dr. Kanu Varani, says Jenny's body had bruising on her hands, arms, face, 
chest and neck. And the ligature mark from the electrical cord found around her neck came post-mortem. If she did not commit suicide, how did she die? She died of the suffocation. We call it chokehold. Suffocation from a chokehold. Things were looking even more suspicious for Blue. He was trained in these chokeholds as part of his um, police training and was in fact uh, a trainer himself. Uh, and interestingly enough, he had his training manual on chokeholds in his police car in the front seat, which was very unusual. Jenny Webb's death is officially ruled a homicide. But there's another bombshell revelation that comes from the autopsy. A seemingly small discovery with a gigantic outcome. When I was processing the victim's clothes, I found the tip to a latex glove. On the inside of the glove tip, my testing indicated the presence of human blood. On the outside, my testing indicated human blood and saliva. DNA testing on the inside came back to show that the blood belonged to Ken Blue. DNA testing on the outside showed a mixed stain from Jennifer Webb and Ken Blue. The theory is that she may have bit his finger during the assault, making him bleed all over the crime scene. And bleed all over he did. His blood was found on the extension cord that was wrapped around the roof rails of her vehicle. His blood was found on her clothing. His blood was found in her car. His blood was found in his patrol vehicle and on his uniform. What about his uniform? Blue gave investigators a laundry bag containing the uniform he said he just had on. The uniforms appeared unworn because the creases in both the front and backs of the legs were still crisp, and the shirt smelled fresh. So police searched and found a second uniform stashed under the rear seat of Blue's truck. That one was less pristine. The second uniform, I examined that and found bloodstains on the um, shirt and on the duty pants. The blood stain on those items came back to be Ken Blue's. Didn't he think he was just brilliant? I believe, without a doubt, he thought he was smarter than everybody else and that he was going to be able to get away with this. And the incriminating evidence kept coming in. Several fingerprints were found on Jenny Webb's car, one in blood. This is the print that was on the passenger side of the victim's vehicle on her Pontiac Aztec. It showed this is the print in blood. You can see the, the recurve of the pattern of the fingerprint. However, in below of this recurve shows damage uh, of some sort that was done uh, to uh, the individual's finger. So Officer Blue was fingerprinted. All right, so what's this? This is a fingerprint of, of uh, the suspect, Officer Ken Blue who was fingerprinted seven, a little over seven days um, after the, uh, the incident. This shows his right index finger with the right loop with the recurve, and it shows the same similar damage done to the fingerprint ridges um, as the area is on the Pontiac Aztec of the victim. Okay, so the bloody print on her car matches his fingerprint and what's truly identical here is the fact that this finger was somehow injured or wounded. That is correct, yes. And there's even more. Remember the three items found 195 feet from her body? The DNA on the cigarette butt came back to match Ken Blue. The DNA on the necklace charm came back to match Jenny Webb. And the blood spot? That came back to match Jenny Webb. Dr. Varani says her nose bled as she was being killed. So what do investigators think happened on that frightful night? We believe they met here, they talked here, and he killed her here. So how do you think he killed her? We think he came up behind her, and he was a big, tall guy, and got in behind her, and using a chokehold, was able to overpower her then because of the marks on his arms, which were, we, there were claw marks in his arms, which indicate she was struggling from and he was behind her. And those three small things, a cigarette butt, something from her necklace, and a drop of her blood, that's how you figured out that this is where he likely killed her? Correct. After he killed her, he loaded her into the back seat of her own vehicle, somewhere right here, and then he drove that vehicle around to where it was later found. Where they say Blue staged the suicide. But how did he do it? I think ultimately what he did was he had her body in the back seat, 
um, tied the extension cord to her neck, tied the extension cord to the car roof rack, uh, and then in all likelihood just pushed her out. There's no other reason for his blood to be all over the back seat, the back cushion, the door sills. Armed with a search warrant, detectives make some interesting discoveries at Blue's home. What'd you end up finding? Very similar extension cords or identical extension cords to what had been used on her body were in a drawer, um, rolled up, folded up, tied up with a twist tie. There was a obvious space where it looked like there could have been at one time another one of those cords, and there was a twist tie laying there. His computer searches had indicated uh, what's the best way to commit suicide, what's the uh, most painless way uh, to commit suicide, uh, what are the uh, circumstances, uh, so the dynamics surrounding vascular compression, strangulation. Uh, all of these were on his computer searches. It looked like the case against Blue was a lock, but was the evidence all a little too perfect? There seems to be a mountain of evidence against Buena Vista Township Police Officer Kenneth Blue. Suspected of murdering the mother of his unborn son, Jenny Webb, and staging it like a suicide, all while on duty. He was a cop. What kind of sick person even dreams about something like that? That's mind boggling. But there was one more piece of evidence that could seal Blue's fate evidence found on the alleged suicide note. On the back of this suicide note, I found and located 14. Uh, latent fingerprints. And Ginther's testing showed not one single print matched Jenny Webb. All 14 matched Officer Ken Blue. But it was the condition of Blue's prints on the note that changed how the case would go forward. There was no damage uh, to the fingerprint ridges. So it's telling me that that particular note uh, was handled by Kenneth Blue prior to his right index uh, finger being damaged. Which investigators believe shows premeditation. So the fact that you found one of his perfect fingerprints on this folded note proves or suggests that he had been carrying this note. Absolutely. And the only way he could have put that perfect fingerprint on the outside of the suicide letter would have been if he did it before he killed her and she bit him. That is absolutely correct, yes. Okay, and the whole case turned there. Officer Ken Blue was arrested and charged with four counts, including first-degree murder and assault on a pregnant individual intentionally causing miscarriage or stillbirth. We would have charged him with another first-degree murder of the baby, except in, in, in the state of Michigan, you can't have first-degree murder of an unborn child. Well, this little baby was eight and a half months along. But there was one person who said Kenneth Blue should never have been arrested in the first place, Blue's sister, Debbie Dennis. I know my brother, and I know he didn't do it. Debbie says she believes Jenny Webb took her own life. The only explanation is she killed herself. And that's hard. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was just an accident. I hate to say that she would have tied a cord around her own neck just to scare him. Some women can be dramatic. I think all of the answers probably died with her. For Debbie, a lot of the case doesn't make sense. Where is the DNA? Where is the evidence that proves that he picked her up and he moved her around and put her in a car? There's no drag marks on her, on her anywhere where he could have drug her. There's no scrapes where he pushed her out of a door. He didn't even have so much. She had long hair, long curly hair. There was not a hair strand on, they had two of his uniforms and there was none of her DNA, none of her hair, no makeup, there was nothing. Debbie believes her brother may have been set up and some of the evidence may have been planted. As for all the blood that they found on her body or in her car, I'm not 100% certain. My theory would be that somebody put the blood there or because they definitely had access to his blood and his fingerprints. Yeah, I do. Can you share those with me? I'm not going to. <laughs> I can't. None of Debbie Dennis's claims of police misconduct have ever been substantiated. 
A little over a year after Jenny was killed, Kenneth Blue went on trial. What was it like when you walked into the courtroom and you saw him? Whew. I was shaking to be face to face with someone that could do that. It was tough. He killed Jenny Webb and made it look like something it wasn't. And that person, ladies and gentlemen, is that man right there, Kenneth Blue. In over three weeks of testimony, the prosecution called 31 witnesses. The defense called only one. What was his defense in court? He didn't really present a specific defense. Just his attorney tried to poke holes in the prosecution's evidence. But the evidence was just overwhelming. It couldn't be done. Kenneth Blue never took the stand. So many details don't quite fit. But please, Tony, have the sympathy. Let your emotions find this man guilty of what he didn't do. The jury deliberated just two hours before rendering their verdict. Guilty on all counts. I've never in my 30-year career seen a case like this one. At the sentencing, Jenny's mother, Dawn Webb, talked directly to Blue. An evil monster is the only words that I can think of for you. So go to your cage and think about how you squeeze the life and breath out of my daughter and grandson. And I hope it haunts you every day for the rest of your life. Ken Blue is sentenced to life in prison, no chance of parole. How do you heal from something like this? You can't, you know. You can't lose a child like that and expect to ever get over it. In an exclusive statement to Crime Watch Daily, Kenneth Blue says in part, after consulting with my legal counsel, I do not feel that it is appropriate to discuss the multitude of vague, inaccurate, and hypothetical statements from an alleged expert and witnesses with personal agendas or the total disregard for proper investigative practices and evidence collection procedures outside of judicial proceedings. Do you really think that he believed he could get away with this? Yes. I believe that he, in his own mind, thought he was smart enough and would be able to get away with it. But he failed terribly, and he was sloppy. I think the sloppiness came from things he couldn't control. Um, uh, Jenny Webb's attack on him, the fact that he's bleeding. I mean, who stages a crime scene while bleeding all over it? Ken Blue did himself in. Ken Blue did himself in with a lot of help from Jenny Webb. She was our best witness. This really impacted you. <laughs> well, you have a what? A little baby boy. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was at his autopsy. I truly believe God made her do what she did, bit his finger, and left all that evidence. I really, truly believe that. For Dawn, she knows Jenny fought hard and ultimately helped solve the case, along with the heart and dedication of some exceptional people. A bad cop killed your daughter, but the good cops got him in prison. That's right.